All right, so today, honestly, I wanted to, I think that you all have, um, you know, you've been very uh, well aware of what's going on um, and some of the findings that, that we have uh, published and whatnot. So I didn't want to bore you um, too much. Uh, I didn't want to uh, bore you too much with uh, more numbers and uh, things that you already know. So um, I wanted just to review uh, some of the things that uh, the newer things and kind of where things are going. Um, and I, I mostly wanted to keep it open for you guys to open questions um, at the end. Um, you know, if you are like me, really, that don't want to be in the front line and asking questions on the microphone, this probably will be a good time and you guys write it down and then we'll try to go through them if you don't want to come and, and ask your, your question or whatnot. And, uh, you know, we try to go through a majority of them as, as we were uh, seeing you all uh, this time or last time or email and whatnot. So anyway, so here we go. Uh, so really the first thing is just to give you an idea of how We've made progress in the last few years. Um, you know, back in 2014, uh, that was kind of when things got started for me. And you know, after that initial uh, report, uh, we were able to write sort of the the review with Dr. Fish um, about what happens and kind of some general recommendations. And then we started collecting some data, and we've been able to you know go back and uh, feed it back to you all. Um, what Allison was saying is that some of these things, you know, to make them open for you all to see or anybody to see, you know, normally it's a couple thousand dollars or three thousand dollars. So my boss sometimes pays for it, um, but every little thing has an expense, you know, like if you want your figures to be colored, you know, it's another couple thousand dollars and it all adds up pretty quickly. So just that's kind of what Allison was alluded to that sometimes some of these things take a lot of money to make them freely free and available to everybody so uh, once we we're done with them of course you know we'll send them back to you all and individually that's much easier to do but i cannot post them in a public website because of copyright unless i had already paid the fee or whatever so anyway um so we've been able to uh go through a lot of the data and publish it uh, in the last few years um on the back side of things, uh, you know, we started the registry uh, in 2016, and then we did the website soon after that. Uh, last year, we were able to add uh, the syndrome to a list of rare diseases, which is important. And if you actually Google uh, glass syndrome or SAPI2 associated syndrome, you know, it comes to the government website as the, the top hit, which is important to, you know, it make, brings more awareness that it's a real thing, it's not something that, you know, is obscure and nobody knows about it kind of thing. We had the first meeting last year, as you all know, um, then the nonprofit this year, and here we are today kind of thing. So as far as the registry, so the registry is what I bug you guys with as far as the forms and all those things. I know it's a pain, but it's really the best way to collect data and to keep it all uh, in one spot and you know I send you guys sort of an online survey after all the paperwork and that allows me to collect the data uh, you know graphics and trends and all those things can be analyzed if I have the data so that's why you know a lot of times I bug you more than once uh, to fill it and complete it uh, and that's the the purpose uh, behind it so I have 103 of you guys that have enrolled in the registry and have completed everything. I normally go on the back end uh, after I request records from you guys as doctors and I go back and edit a couple of things and I have like a side uh, form that, you know, for the medical side of things that I didn't ask you directly, but the, I can find on the medical records and I go back and um, add a few things. So. Um, 103 have completed the process, seven more have completed the paperwork, but not necessarily the online part of it. Um, so that's 110 that we know so far. And then I, I have been in touch with 34 other families, uh, but just kind of fell through or didn't follow through the, the paperwork and whatnot. Um, and I know about 59 patients that outside the ones that we have reported that have been reported in the past. So that, that brings the total of around 200 that I know about. 
uh, the Facebook group, of course, I don't know, you know, how many of them have contacted me or not. So there might be many more that are even within the Facebook group. So as far as how common, um, so I know about at least a couple hundred. Uh, I can guarantee you all that, that there are many more out there that just have not been tested. As you all know, uh, the, how you make the diagnosis a lot of times takes many years to get to the correct test to find it. And we have the technology to even bother testing for some of these things until more recently. So I, I would imagine that there are you know, thousands out there that are just undiagnosed um, so far. All right, so the data that I was able to compile from what I know about, um, including the ones that have been published uh, previously and the ones that you know, I, we have enrolled in the registry, this is slight male predominance, not that it's really that significant. And we're gonna talk slightly about the different uh, ways that you can get the syndrome, like a quick overview. Um, so in the past, um, until the genetic testing evolved and we were able to look at the gene more carefully, the majority of patients had what we call a deletion. So that deletion, again, is just when you have a piece missing of the gene or the SAB2 gene along with other genes. But now, the, with all the data and knowing the technology is advancing, now the point mutations are really taking over. So point mutations, if your child has a missense mutation, nonsense mutation, frame shift mutation, splice size mutation, all those things, those are what we call point mutations. So one letter for a letter kind of thing. So those are now the majority of the cases. But you see that we still have, of course, some uh, chunk of what we call large deletions, and there's a few that have had duplications. Duplication is when you have an extra piece, and that damages that gene as well. And then we have a few other things, but the majority, again, is now shifting into those that have a letter for a letter of what we call a mutation. So if you look at the age distribution, this is the kind of stuff that is nice on the online thing that you guys complete. I can create different graphics and whatnot. So for example, if you do an age plot, so this is part of the limitations that we have. So the vast majority of the kids are 10 and younger. You know, so we have some that are in the 10 to 20 range and then a few that you can count almost with one hand that are in the 20 to 30 and even less so older than 30. But the vast majority of the data comes from the, the, the bulk of the data comes from the first 10 years of life. So um, just, you know, being patient with the, the lack of data for adults is one of the things because we don't have it simply. All right, so as far as the mechanisms, just a quick overview on how you get the syndrome, just as a reminder. So just remember, when we talk about the SADB2 gene, so just like any other gene, it has a name. And every gene, the function of the gene, so when you translate that gene, when your body reads the instructions of that gene, it produces a protein. And then that protein is what it will have some kind of effect in our bodies. So for SADB2 associated syndrome, SADB2 is the gene, the protein is also called SADB2, and then the SADB2 protein is what has the function. So what we do know is that the SADB2 protein controls many other genes, and that's really part of the problem as far as why you know, so many systems are involved and even part of the limitation of why it's hard to find one thing that will fix the problem because it's a gene that controls so many other genes down the road that is, it makes it challenging. So it's, what, it's implicated in what we call transcription of other genes. So it regulates when genes are supposed to be turned on or turned off at different tissues, so bone, brain, uh, you know, palate, teeth. So some of the things that we see in the kids is, is because this is a master gene of other genes kind of knowing what they're supposed to be doing at a given time. So a quick, really quick review on the different uh, ways that you can get the syndrome. So when we talk about a deletion, again, it's a piece missing. So if you remember from your biology days, so all chromosomes have what we call a P arm, which is the short arm, and then a long arm, which is the Q arm. And just remember, we all have the same amount of chromosomes, 46 chromosomes, so it's distributed in pairs, and we get, you know, for each, we get one from mom, one from dad, and then the sex pair. So in chromosome two is where the SABB2 gene, and all these letters, what it means is just 
where exactly, just think of it as your zip code or your home address kind of thing. And it's important, you know, that's why I insist sometimes like, okay, let me see a genetic testing result so I can pinpoint exactly where it is. So uh, the SABI2 gene is uh, the, the specific address for it, if you may, is a Q33.1, so that part that is highlighted here. And there's different, two different ways that you can have that piece missing. So either you're missing the whole part, a part of that gene, the SABI2 gene, or you're missing SAB2 gene along with other genes, so it depends on what other material is missing. So that's what we call uh, a large deletion uh, for practical purposes, it's the SAB2 gene along with other genes, or what we call an intragenic deletion is just a tiny piece within the SAB2 gene that is missing. All right, so now we go again with the most common mechanism, which is when you have mutations. So there's different types of mutations and I will try to simplify it as much as I can. So normally, if you remember, all the DNA is, you know, there's four different letters that we all have to give the instructions. And if, if you go by groups of three letters, each three letters is read as a building block of a protein, what we call an amino acid. So every three letters means something for our body, specifically for a protein to be produced. And that's the way it's read. So um, if you mess one letter that throws the whole thing out of the way. So, for example, if normally, you know, you have the three letters T, C, G, that is supposed to be read in that order, gives you this amino acid, right, serin. So if you mess that up and you now don't have that C, but rather you have a T, and you know, each letter you can, counting, starting with one, then you can count what position is it, so the, the letter 1,946 that was supposed to be a, a C is now a T. So that, actually this is not a replacement, you have an extra one, I'm sorry. So you, you're throwing the whole thing off by one letter. So you added one T that wasn't supposed to be here. So if you look at it, it was TCG, now you have TTC, and it all got shifted one letter to the right. So now that throws out the whole thing away, and at some point, there's gonna be a new code of three letters that is gonna stop that protein for, for forming the whole thing. So that's what we call a frame shift mutation. So a nonsense mutation is similar principle. So you're replacing a letter by a letter, but our body has very specific instructions for when to stop a protein for, for, from building. You know? So if you have the initial instructions with CGA, and instead of a C, now you have a T, TGA, our body reads it as stop right there. It doesn't matter what it is. So you're stopping at that moment, but you, you haven't built the whole protein. So that will, for practical purposes, that protein is not gonna work if it's short. If that makes sense. So many of the kids have what we call a missense mutation. So a missense mutation is a little tricky in the sense that you have a letter for a letter and you're changing the, the code so instead of having a GGA that was supposed to code for this, now you have a CGA, and that codes for a different amino acid, but otherwise it looks pretty normal from that point on. But th that switch, even though you're producing exactly the same length, that one amino acid that is different is gonna make that protein not working right. And that's the missense part of it is a little harder to understand and we're working on and all the groups in the UK have tried to understand this better, what happens. So if I may put a couple examples here at results. So if you look at it, this is the most common missense mutation. Um, so many of the kids have exactly the same misspelling. Um, so this one, so at the position 1165, it was supposed to be a C and is now a T that tells the, the, the building block to be different. So now the protein that was supposed to produce this amino acid that is short with an R, now is switched to a C. So that is, is enough to cause problems. And I'll show you a graphic in a second of what that means. On the other side, you have what we call a nonsense mutation. So the same idea. So at the position 1,375, you were supposed to have a C, now you have a T. And that is going to create a problem. Um, so when you see an X in the report, that means it's a nonsense mutation. 
and five of the kids have this type of mutation specifically is the most common within this population. And then the last type that I alluded to was this mi uh, frame shift mutation. So you're either missing a letter or adding a letter that wasn't supposed to be there. So you're not replacing the letter for a letter, you're just adding one or missing one. And that throws the whole thing of the frame and that's why it's called the frame shift. So that is an example of an actual uh, report on one of the kids. So and when you look at the reports, if it says de novo, it means that you guys had a test that included samples analyzed on mom and dad. So if it's de novo, it means that neither mom or dad had it in their blood or the saliva. Sometimes it's tested. So again, you're only testing blood in most situations. You're not testing any other tissue or sample. So, and then as far as deletions go, if, um, again, the report will tell you how big is it and where is the piece missing. If you think of, let's say, a computer file, it's exactly the same thing. So you can have, um, you know, deletions that are 10 kilobases. So uh, kilo, again, is 1,000. So 10,000 letters missing to 24.7 megabases. So think about your, you know, PowerPoint presentations. It will tell you what the size of the file is. You know, 24 megas of a PowerPoint is a really large presentation. 10 kilobases is a really tiny uh, file. You know, a Word document with no pictures is 10 kilobases kind of thing. So, and again, the novo for this specific thing will be exactly the same. It means that neither parent had it in the blood most of the time when they was tested. So, and you can plot all these pieces missing or all these changes into the protein and see where they are located. And this is part, and then you can go back by different mechanism, okay? So was it what we call a frame shift? Was it what we call a nonsense? Was it what we call a missense? And where are they located? And then you start seeing, okay, well, if the, the majority of missense are located right over here. And what this is right here at the bottom is the extremely oversimplified version of the SABB2 protein. So the SABB2 protein is 733 amino acids locked. Again, amino acids are the building blocks of, the, of a given protein. So again, if you go back and look at your genetic testing results, it's gonna have a P dot blah, blah, blah. So it gives you sort of the exact amino acid that is changed within so from one to 733, those are the options. So one of them is the wrong one, uh, if I may say that. So you can go back again and kind of plot it and see uh, where it is. So, but is that, that's again the oversimplified version of it because no protein is just a line, of course. So, and this is where the missense mutations come into play. So I say, you know, for frame shifts and nonsense, those are easier to explain just because you know you have an amino acid that is the wrong one and then your body is going to stop that protein from producing so you're going to instead of 733 amino acids you're going to cut it short at, at whatever point the body is telling it to stop so 200 300 400 whatever it is that protein is not going to work so that is easier to understand so for missense mutations it's definitely much harder to understand because that you st you're still gonna produce the same length protein, 733 amino acids, but just one of them is the wrong one. So, and what we think is that that one being different is enough to cause problems for the function of the gene. So the SABB2 gene, so this is, you know, kind of the cartoon version of, you know, each different area of the protein looks different. So if you look back here, so the SABB2 protein has different areas that have different functions. So you see the CUT1, CUT2 at the bottom. So we think that those two areas are important for the SABB2 protein to uh, bind or to join the DNA of other genes to tell it what to do. I said before that the SABB2 protein was important to tell other genes what to do. So how does it do it? Well, we think that these two areas, this CUT1 and CUT2, are the areas that actually attach to the other genes, the other uh, DNA of the other genes to tell it what, what to do. So if you're messing up the structure of this uh, CUT1 with a missense variant, then it's preventing it 
from doing what it's supposed to be doing. So for practical purposes, it's going to result in something very similar, which is the, gene, the protein not doing what it's supposed to be doing. So this is more of like what we think the, the protein, that area of the protein will look like. But what you see here at the bottom is, again, the, this, this, this cartoon is representing, again, this CUT1, this CUT2. And then this bottom part is a strand of DNA. And what we think is that those two areas, again, are critical to bind the DNA of other genes and tell it what to do kind of thing. So you're messing up the structure of that portion of the protein that is supposed to have the main event or the main function of the gene. So that's what we think. Hopefully with some of the things that we're doing and some of the samples we've collected, we can understand a little bit better or confirm that that's the case, but that's the best guess that we have at the moment. So just like you had a diagram of where all the mutations were, you can do the same with the deletions. So you can go back you know, and pinpoint what's missing. So you can see the cartoon here. So again, we're looking at the address here, which is 2Q33.1. This is the representation of the SABB2 gene. And each one of these represents a tiny piece that is missing in that gene, or again, a, sometimes a larger portion of that gene that is missing. And then this is an even zooming out version of it. So you see a SABB2 gene here that we were seeing zooming in or a slide before. And you can see there are you know, many patients that have much larger chunks of genes missing going both ways to the left or to the right. So you know, any of these individuals is gonna be missing a bunch of genes, just not the SABB2 gene, but other genes that may have other functions and you know, important uh, clinical features and whatnot. All right, so uh, we talk about the demographics and the, going back to now that I explained the different um, ways that you can get it, you can maybe perhaps follow this slide a little bit better. So again, the majority of uh, the patients that we follow and that I know about have what we call point mutations. So any of those three groups, missense, nonsense, frame shifts, are in this category. And then what we just talked about, this deletion group, um, either large deletions, which you see here, or smaller deletions, which you see here in orange. So that's kind of the breakdown, um, and we talk about this. So um, you all know of the features um, of the syndrome. So this is just with larger numbers. Uh, now that, with the, as of today, with everybody that is in the registry, plus the ones that have been published previously, so you all know the main features. So speech delay, um, as far as I know, is, is universal, 100%. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, some of the data may be collected on babies and of course the speech is much harder to assess at that age, but for those that are speech age appropriate, it's going to be delayed. The abnormalities of the palate and cleft palate, this is again updated numbers, just about half the time um, we see cleft palate. And then the difference between this 60 to 70 percent and this 47 percent, so um, there are some that have high palate, some that have bifid uvulus. So if you combine cleft palate, bifid uvula, high palates, that's, that's the two-thirds kind of th number that I'm throwing in there. We have the teeth anomalies, uh, which again, as uh, the dental group was uh, explaining earlier, you know, uh, last year, uh, you know, I was partially responsible for it. They were saying that it was their first day, and I remember how uh, hard it was, but you know, um, it started very non-specific. We knew that they were dental anomalies, teeth problems, but over time, we've been able to, you know, pinpoint a little bit better what's going on. But again, for those that um, have had teeth coming in, is it, there are abnormalities almost always, um, if not always. The behavioral problems. There's a broad range of behavioral problems, as you all know, uh, closer to 80 percent. And then the bone issues. Uh, the tricky part of it is that we have not just until recently we've been able to do bone scans on more people so we're finding it more and more so whenever we do the bone scan we're finding more abnormalities that we were aware of so the 25 30 percent is total but not necessarily only those that have had bone scans so if you compile just those that have had bone scans it's over half of them have a low bone density 
um, for what it's worth. I mean, because we're still trying to understand what, what, even if it's low, what does it mean uh, for the child? And then the brain abnormalities, this is on brain MRI, so about half the time uh, for those that have had brain MRIs, uh, there are some abnormalities there. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you guys what we're doing as far as looking at those things. And then invariably the age of onset is before two years. So we know about the, the features and you guys are aware of all those features. And this is just an updated number sort of thing more than anything else. There's a broad range of features. You know, when I was, um, I, I came up with the sort of acronym to, to uh, help uh, other providers and families remember um, but then over time, of course, we've been able to find more things that did not necessarily um, flow as nicely in the acronym anymore. Um, so those are the other features. So there are feeding difficulties as the speech group was presenting. They are very prevalent. Um, of course, for those that have the cleft palate or the high palate, that might be even more uh, frequent, but the hypotonia plays a role in the feeding difficulties. The low muscle tone, again, the hypotonia, um, that is very common uh, from what I can tell reported by you guys as providers a lot of the time neurologists uh, growth retardation um, especially at the beginning uh, seems to be quite prevalent um, about a third of the time uh, it seems to uh, part of it is related to the feeding issues of course uh, but what I'm seeing is that it tends to plateau at some point and we were just making the comment uh, with, with Katie and um, our team that it seems like uh, over time, um, most of the teenagers are just kind of skinny and you know tall and thin kind of thing. And I was making the comment that I, I don't remember anybody in this population that is obese for, for some reason. So, and you would think that you will find some if the statistics in the general population were to be follow you would anticipate to find more than one that is obese and I don't I out of the ones that we evaluated last year and the ones that we evaluated this year I don't remember any uh, that were above the normal centiles for for percentiles for weight um, so there, there's there I don't know if it's higher metabolism or what uh, possibly going on uh, strabismus what we call a lazy eye sometimes um, often seeing the need for glasses also is pretty common uh, problems with balance and uh, sort of a gait uh, abnormality about 20-25% of the time. And seizures about 20%. I know many of you were asking what the age of onset was. It's pretty broad. Um, many of uh, the kids that have had it have been diagnosed um, the first couple years of life. Some have been diagnosed a little bit later. I told you all the same story today. The longer a child goes without having seizures, the less likely it will be that down the road they will ever develop it. There's different types of seizures, as you all know. The most common type, I would say, for this uh, children will be the staring spells, what we call the absence uh, type of seizures. But others have had different types of seizures, including grand mal seizures and whatnot. All right, so and then we get to a hot topic. Um, Thanks to um, some of the recent findings. Um, and I asked Mary if it was okay to mention her by name and she gave me a permission. So I know um, you guys have some questions about it. So this is what I know as far as the numbers go. Uh, could this happen again? So I know there's a pair of siblings um, in the UK that have the same mutation. Again, siblings as in not twins because that will, uh, identical twins, it does not really count for, for this uh, purpose um, if it could happen again. So I know about a pair of twins that have what we call a point mutation, again, a letter for a letter. I know last year we, we evaluated um, the family from Portugal. Uh, they have what we call a duplication, which is an extra piece. And then I know of one case, they went through what we call whole exome sequencing. Just remember whole exome sequencing, many of, of your kids had it um, as the way to diagnose the syndrome. So you're looking at the child's blood and more likely than not, mom and dad's blood analyzed at the same time. So I know of one case, the dad of one of the kids had well, detected mosaicism in the blood. So mosaicism, 
refers to when some of the cells have a mutation, some of the cells do not. So some cells are normal, some are not normal. So the, the dad of this child had it detected in blood. So I don't know what that means. I, like if I was seeing that family, I'm not sure how I would counsel them as far as the chances of having another child. If it's detected in blood in some of the cells, you would think that maybe some of the sperm will have it, but I don't know exactly. It's probably a little bit higher than I will tell any of you that have not had it in blood, but I don't know the exact percentage. And the last case, uh, uh, with Mary's permission, so uh, Chelsea and Lily appeared to have the same deletion. It was a little confusion as we discussed um, with Mary that, um, so Chelsea had a deletion and then Lily had a testing look, a te test to look for the same deletion and it was a slightly different. I do think that is because the way they were testing more than being two separate things, I still think it's the same thing. Um, but Lily, honestly, she looked completely normal to me. We were talking about it yesterday um, or Wednesday. Um, she looked completely normal to me. She doesn't have a cleft palate and none of the other features that I would anticipate it. Her muscle tone was good. So I would not have suspected it. So um, we're doing the testing um, and we'll be able to tell uh, with more precision if that's what's going on or not. What are some options if you're thinking of growing your family or if people in your family are asking, um, just being aware of what are the options for growing your family and the chance that this might happen again and in each of those uh, scenarios. So as Dr. Zarate said, um, to proceed with a natural conception and a natural pregnancy between the same parents of a child with SAS, um, that would have a low recurrence risk. What, what that means is a low chance of this happening again, um, about 2%. To some families, that's a very low number. And we realize to some families, that's a very high number. And they would love to do everything they could to make that number as close to zero as we can get. In science, uh, unlike in politics, you can never be sure of anything. So 0% and 100% are just not numbers that we're able to work with a lot in science, um, and genetics is no exception. So we can get that risk lower with different options, but we can't quite get it to zero. Um, whenever parents have been tested and they have been found to be negative for a SATB2 change that their child carries, they, we know that they have about that 2% chance of having another child with SAS. If that number still remains too high and you'd like to reduce it, then you might explore other options, such as using a sperm and an egg donor. Now, you might ask, why not use one or the other? And that's because we can't test every cell of a person's body. Whenever you went to the doctor and you got tested for SATB2, they likely tested your blood, your saliva, and even in some cases, skin but you're only getting a small amount of cells and you're not gonna be able to get all the cells in your body tested. And we'll talk about um, some specific scenarios with the sperm and egg cells that uh, kind of lead to that higher chance than zero. So using a sperm and an egg donor to inseminate and carry a natural pregnancy is a way to have a carried pregnancy um, without an above average risk for SATB2. Additionally, you might choose to go through something called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. This is a way to have a child that is um, naturally, biologically your child. And this is an invasive, kind of complex process. What it involves is going through in vitro fertilization, just like any couple that might be having trouble getting pregnant would go through. You go through that same process of trying to get the body to grow and release more eggs, harvesting those eggs, fertilizing it with sperm, and then at that stage, it becomes a unique process. They would grow the embryo a little bit, take out a few cells from that growing embryo, and then do genetic testing for the known familial variant or mutation in SATB2. 
there are other tests that can be done on um, that same embryo to make sure that you're putting in the healthiest embryo you can. And that's an individual choice of each family. And that's because there are so many options and they're so complex. If this is something that you're interested in or would like to explore, I would definitely suggest meeting with a reproductive genetic specialist because as some of our families might have experienced, this process is costly. There are a lot of logistical issues to consider, like the fact that um, not only are they going to be testing the embryo, but they would likely need to have a positive control, meaning a sample from your SAS kiddo, and parental samples, so the whole family might have to go in for blood draws after you found the particular lab that feels comfortable doing it. One of the reasons for some of those logistical concerns is that when you're taking cells out of an embryo that's already only so many cells, um, you don't have a whole lot of margin for error. When you get a blood draw, you have thousands and thousands of cells to test. But when you're working with an embryo, you only have those few cells. So that's why it is a little bit more of an intensive process. Whenever you go through pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, you might test that embryo, and if it were negative for SATV2, you might choose to implant that embryo or a number of healthy, healthy embryos um, through the process. That does not guarantee a healthy baby, just like hardly anything can guarantee a healthy baby. Any couple having a kiddo um, in the United States is going to have a 3 to 5% chance of having a child with some health issue or genetic condition. And so even though we might reduce the risk of SATB2, we might not get those other chances down to zero. So now that we've talked about some options for future pregnancies in a very broad scope, I love to talk a little bit about how this is passed on in families and the different um, scenarios that that might look like, just because sometimes this comes up whenever you might have a brother or sister asking if they're at risk or will it affect their kids. Um, we notice that most of our SATB2 kiddos are the only ones in their family to have this and the parents are often tested with blood, skin, saliva and are found negative. Um, that is what Dr. Zarate referred to as de novo, and that means that the chances of having another child with a SATB2 change is very low, about 2%. In the cases where we see more than one sibling in the family that has SATB2 associated syndrome, we assume that this is something called germline mosaicism. Germline means egg cells or sperm cells. And mosaicism means you have a genetic change in only some cells of your body, but not all of them. So when these parents get tested for their blood, they are more than likely going to be negative. But they probably have a very small percentage of cells in their body, including their egg or sperm cell, and we can't tell which, that does carry the SATB2 um, gene change um, that led to that in their children. We cannot go in everyone's ovaries or testicles and take out all the cells to test. Unfortunately, there's no way to rule out how big or small someone's chance of being a germline mosaic carrier is, other than just looking at our 200 kiddos that we know of, how many times has this happened? That's how we get that 2% number, and that's our best bet at giving you kind of those chances or odds. This could happen in the mom's egg or in the dad's sperm. Um, and I know lots of us uh, who are you know, thinking about getting pregnant or have gone through a pregnancy know that some genetic conditions may be more common in a mom's egg but this is not something that would necessarily be associated with that, and we just can't tell um, where these come from when we find them. And as Dr. Zarate alluded to, it would be very, very rare and unusual to have a parent test positive for a SATB2 variant. It has happened once where even in the blood, they found it in a father at a very, very low level, meaning most of his blood cells did not have it, 
but some of them did. And um, that father had children with SATB2. Does it happen in every pregnancy? No, it does not. If a parent were found to have SATB2 change in a majority of their cells, um, then the maximum risk for each and every pregnancy would be about 50%. And that's because we have two copies of SATB2 in our bodies, and even our kiddos do. Now, one copy might be changed, but the other copy is healthy. And we don't know which one we pass on with each pregnancy. Excellent, and I'll give this back to uh, Dr. Girante. Thank you. All right, thank you, Julie. Um, so you may wonder, why is the Avengers thing going on here? So I wanted to bring this up really quickly. So if you, if you all are familiar with the Avengers, the way Marvel did it, they had faces for all their movies, and it, there was a system to their madness, right? So this is just an example of phase one, and I don't know what phase they are now, but there's like 20 movies, and it, it all had a purpose in the end, right? So this is the part that I wanted to uh, portray Avengers here, but anyway. Um, so as far as what's upcoming uh, research-wise, so the first part, and this is also the, something that Dr. Fish was talking about, so we need to understand what happens uh, first at every level. So I work on the clinical side of things. She works on the you know cell level, uh, what happens at that level um, first. So we know what's going on. Uh, and before we try to fix the problem, we need to know what the problem is, is bottom line, what it comes down to. So today, we presented the dental uh, findings. So that uh, we already wrote up and we're gonna submit it hopefully next week. So for some of you that you were asking, you know, could you write a letter and are those findings, you know, uh, something that you could, um, you know, put somewhere. So it's been written. Um, so hopefully it gets submitted uh, next week. So what um, the dental group was presenting earlier. So that's coming up. So I know for a fact that's coming up. So brain MRI. So we, I requested MRIs from many of you guys directly or many of your physicians. So I went back uh, with one of the pediatric neuroradiologists here and then I sent some uh, copies to a physician, a doctor in CHOP, a CHOP um, Philadelphia. So we're looking at the MRIs without knowing what the radiologist said and try to look, can we find the same abnormalities that the radiologist reported blindly? Um, I'm not a neurologist, so that's why I recruited people that uh, were really good at it. And then, can we correlate the MRI findings to what we're seeing in the, in the, in the children? You know, so does it predict who might be more verbal or who's going to have seizures or whatnot? So we know that there's a variety of MRI abnormalities. We just don't know what they mean yet. So stay tuned for that. So um, all, actually all these, they're, I'm hoping within the next year we will have something, some data published somewhere. Uh, so dental, the brain MRI. I do want to do the adult quality of life. So that one is really important. Um, I realized. Uh, so the... You know, many of you have asked about quality of life and what happens down the road and how independent are adults and whatnot. So we don't have that data. So I, th I recognize that's important. Um, and I'm going to need you guys' help uh, for those of you that are parents of, you know, older teenagers or adults. So we're going to, I want to do that. So um, stay tuned for that as well. Speech, uh, they presented their work. Um, so combining what they have already tabulated from last year plus what we have this year. Um, I'm hoping that we will write that up the same as you guys were asking, you know, could you provide recommendations as far as what you think should be done in this group and your findings, same story. So we're gonna compile that data, I'm hoping again within the next year and publish it. So that's the way to get the word out there. So we'll. Uh, present something similar as far as you know common things objective things and then at the end here's what we would recommend so you know everybody has the same thing and then you notice that this time 
during this clinic, we had the, the psychology group uh, came by. So they were collecting data for the same idea. So what are the common problems, uh, sleep problems, behavioral issues, what medications are they on? So objectively, we were trying to do some data collection. Um, so on the clinical side of things, those are the things that are coming up uh, within the next year, I'm hoping, for no, no more than two years for sure. All right, so from the lab perspective, so we've been uh, assessing vitamin D, alkaline phosphatase, which is again something you measure in blood, um, and a variety of other bone markers. We did that last year. We've been doing it uh, this year in some of you, your kids. Um, and then as far as the function of the gene, as Dr. Fish um, presented yesterday, so uh, we collected skin biopsies in three uh, children. We were hoping for five, but really it was rather logistically challenging. I recognize that, you know, some of the kids had to stay still for a, a little longer than they were willing to and whatnot. So we start with the three, um, and Dr. Fish and I talk about it yesterday. So this will give us a head start as far as what we want to do. And she explained kind of what we can do with the skin. So we're hoping that we can now, first for the first time at the human level, then you know get the skin and use some cells again you can reprogram some of those cells to generate brain cells and bone cells and then what happens at that level when you damage these genes so that will allow us to understand better what happens um and you know if we think that there will be some medications or something that you know look potential then that's a good way to start testing what could work before we translate it into an actual individual that is, you know, willing to take uh, whatever medication we're testing. So those, those are the things that we're working on uh, right now. Mm -hmm. So last year, uh, we collected, if you remember, we collected some blood samples for additional research too. So th this is just like half of the data. Uh, we're still kind of analyzing the data. But what we did, we were hoping, is there, there's a study that we can do in blood looking at what are the levels of the different proteins in your body that go up or go down when you damage this gene. So, and is there something that we can use to predict what's gonna happen based on what you're seeing, the, the levels of a given protein up or down, can you predict who's gonna have bone issues, more uh, verbal communication or whatnot. So this is one example of kind of the data, the way we were looking at it. So. If you, each number is an ID number, each child has an ID number that I keep. I, I'm the only one that knows who's who. Um, so if you look, so we were like, okay, well, let's see, can we predict who has bone issues based on this study? And actually, it breaks down very nicely. The ones on the right side have bone issues, and the ones on the left side do not. So and I, the program doesn't know this. I, I was able to like, okay, we're, let's look at the bone issue. So it's an example of one of the things that uh, we're working on. And again, this is half of the data. The other half I'm hoping to uh, get analyzed within the, six month, the next six months or so um, to see a similar story, not at the protein level where proteins go up and down, but now at the gene level, I can also look what genes go up or down uh, when you mutate or when you damage the, the sab 2 gene. All right, uh, as far as the clinic, um, I'm gonna go back um, and talk to the dental group. This is a primarily a heavily dental uh, syndrome, I recognize, so in the clinic this time was run through dental, and last year we did it through ENT, but it's really more of a dental sort of component. So my goal will be long-term um, I don't know starting when, but I'm going to go back and talk to dental to hold a clinic, uh, dedicated SAPI to clinic twice a year. That is my goal, but we'll see what happens. So the problem is that last year, I'll tell you all the full disclaimers here. So last year, we saw 35, 37 patients. My boss covered you guys' out-of-pocket expenses, so none of you would see a bill. So we went through insurance. And whatever insurance they didn't pay, then my boss paid. This time around, so similar story. We went through insurance, and you know, you all have sent information to Cindy, and at the end, I will give thanks to a bunch of people. But Cindy 
uh, who's the insurance specialist, went through all the insurance and got all the pre-authorizations and whatnot, and for out-of-state Medicaid, whatever we could recoup and whatnot. So we go through insurance where the dental group is providing $25,000 to offset the cost of whatever your insurance is not going to pay. So it's not sustainable on a long term to, to do that on a year to year basis for this amount of people. So um, the plan would be to have a clinic, a smaller clinic, but still this, smaller in the sense of how many patients per clinic we will see, but still see everybody that has been involved. So dental, speech, myself, behavioral, um, orthodontia and whatnot. And, you know, um, have it maybe over two days, you know, not as many people, but it will have to rely heavily on having the insurance covering now the majority of it. Because, again, I don't know how sustainable it would be to have the hospital or dental paying for the out-of-pocket expenses. So there will be some limitations, and I will need help with uh, some kind of coordinator to dedicated time to, to allocate for this. But that is my hope to have it. You want to wait until the end or now? Please. Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I'm, uh, you know, it depends on, honestly, it depends on the demand that there is and the need for it. So I wanted to start, again, with a minimum of twice a year. I know there's, you know, dedicated clinics for other rare syndromes in many places, and they hold their clinics, you know, eight or ten times a year, you know. So as a, as a starting point, that's, that's kind of what I was suggesting so I think that, and this year we had a good mix of both, and the 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 we had a we had to put a cap just because physically it's not not possible to see everybody, and that's probably why you guys were not able to get in. Um, so I would say you know a mix, you know, and depending on who can make it here and logistically what works, um, we we you know speech can corroborate this. Like we got really good input from the follow-up visits you know we were able to see improvement or trends and whatnot but we also want to see new people so i mean that we haven't really worked all the kings but um you know we want to start twice a year and if it's, if there's the need then see what we can do to expand it to more than twice a year but my goal will be for everybody not just new or uh, you know so if it's a follow-up follow-up um you know, for new people, for sure. This year, we try to prioritize the new people, for sure. Um, and this is just a photo from the uh, hospital website about this clinic. And um, All right, so I have a bunch of questions myself, um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I know you guys have a million more. So the, the bottom line, I think that we're making progress. But there's probably a lot more that I that we don't know. That's just me. But we don't know. Um, so like I want to understand how is it that you know there's actually more than one that have exactly the same misspelling, exactly the same, and they're so different. You know. So what predicts who's gonna have what problem? It bothers me not knowing, but it's the reality of it. So. Um, and ultimately, I know that the goal for any geneticist or, uh, you know, is to help out and eventually find the cure or the fix for a genetic problem. That is the hope for, that we all have and for you guys even more so. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to uh, uh, take any questions that you guys have. Again, before I finish, um, there's a really large effort to make this happen. So I'm just a tiny portion of the whole thing. So, And I was taking care primarily of the clinic side of things. So on the clinic side, Katie and Julie um, on um, for the actual clinic, uh, Cindy in the insurance, Diana who did all the logistics. Um, the, you guys have no idea how many hundreds of emails go back and forth to try to make my catering happening and even this room happening. So Allison and Ashling and uh, you guys for being here, but please, um, this is when you get to ask uh, questions. Your question is from Terrence, right? 
And again, if you if you if you don't want to come up here and you wrote it down, then I'm happy to, you know, take um, questions and read them out loud. Um, so I know we've spoken a bit about this um, through email, but kind of just to answer for all the parents. Sure. Um, so I know that there's a lot of us that are very eager to kind of do any and everything to kind of get the ball rolling, and I'm also crazy impatient, so there's that. Um, I know research takes many, many years, and after going to lots of rare disease legislation conferences and meeting lots of people, um, unfortunately, uh, research due to funding and all sorts of modern medicine obstacles takes like 10, 20, 40 years. Um, that's just not something I'm willing to wait for, mm -hmm. kind of the impatient problem kicking in. Um, so is there absolutely anything that like we can do? I mean, I'm near NIH. I can kick in a door at NIH. I can kick in a door at a biotech company. Mm -hmm. Um, so is there any, I mean, just talking to other researchers or any sort of specific um, multidisciplinary team anywhere else to recruit them to your team? Does that help at all? Is there anything I guess we can do, hmm. even funding-wise, apply for grants, anything like that? Um, well, thank you. Um, that, that is a good point. Um, it, it's just like there's two arms for the research. So one is the bench side of research, which is what Dr. Fish does, right? So, um, you know, she and I collaborate back and forth, and I know what is going on on her side. So she goes through the government agencies to, like the NIH, uh, to get funded for some of the stuff. But as you pointed out, it's a very competitive uh, field, and funding, um, you know, it gets cut uh, here and there, uh, not to get political about it. Um, but, so that's one thing. And then on the clinical side, you know, like my my biggest thing is time you know how you allocate time to make it happen you know so um it's a combination of things so i don't i don't know if you if you guys other than what you all have done which is actively participating and advocating for your child and like you know many of you were willing to you know take my blood and take my skin and whatnot um I'm not sure if that, if past that, what else, you know, because um, even Dr. Fish, I mean, and she's pretty, pretty experienced with dealing with the NIH and whatnot, and, you know, we, we write grants together and whatnot, and it's not up to us at that point, you know, and there are, you know, now thousands of rare diseases, and how, how do the funding agencies prioritize who gets the funding, you know, so that's part of the process, trying to you know, like as an example, just get it, uh, get uh, SAS, you know, recognized as a rare disease to begin with because the government needs to recognize it as a rare disease. So from your point, I don't, I don't know what else could you do. I mean, we'll take whatever um, effort you can do, but I don't know if it will result into, if it will translate into more funding. I, I'll jump in and say, um, I'm going to talk really quickly and then we'll finish up about the work groups but contributing to the work groups, um, having a say um, you know, in the different activities that we put out there in the parent survey, um, encouraging other families in the Facebook group to enroll in the registry, um, you know, giving your opinion through the foundation about where we should focus our efforts. That's where we're going to really need a lot of help and a lot of active participation. Um, so I, that we'll be reaching out to you. And, and as you have research questions, feel free to, you know, or other types of questions, feel free free to email Dr. Z or Allison or myself, um, and we are in constant communication with each other to talk about these things. So. Um, I was wondering, um, the uh, osteoporosis that occurs in, um, uh, in CES, mm -hmm. could that be an item, because osteoporosis is a big thing in, in our whole society with people getting older, etc. Right. Could that be an issue that could interest it? Could interest other researchers that are doing research into osteoporosis in SEPI two? Maybe. What's your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, and um, that's a fantastic point, and part of the you know that's one angle that I wanted to approach, and that's how we started last year we were, okay, let's look at bone. And the one slide I show about the, the it's called proteomics, which you look at the protein levels up or down for those that have bone problems, is exactly going, the, bis, the basic principle is that exactly. So osteoporosis, as you pointed out, it is, um, 
general population thing, but it's the same idea. So can I identify a marker that, you know, it will predict osteoporosis in this population? And then to your point, can I extrapolate that to the general population? Like, can I get a patent on it or something else that will be an income generating um, sort of activity? Um, and I, I tried last year two different uh, companies that produce products for different genetic conditions that have uh, a heavy bone component. So one is called uh, Exling um, hypophosphate, well, excuse me, one is hypophosphatasia, which is a bone problem, and they have an enzyme product that is a shot that you give but the mechanism for that is just completely different. So like if I take a kid with SAS and give that enzyme, it's not going to fix it. But I approach him like, hey, you know, is this something that you'll be interested in? I really didn't. They want to, the first thing is, is the same thing we're trying to do. How big of a problem is it in the general population? They don't want to just get one niche, you know, is, is the, the more money they can make, the better is the bottom line. So um, we started with bone and that is that, what we're trying to do. So can we find something that would allow us to, you know, uh, tabulate how common is it for the general population and go from there? Yeah, exactly. Hey, Dr. Z, how you doing? Yep. So uh, my questions are going to be in regards to treatments or therapies. Uh, first off, I want to know, um, with gene, gene editing, obviously it's, it's huge, it's still developing. Is that anything that with the SAS, SAS kids, is that something that could possibly be a feasible treatment in the future as they you know, perfect that a little bit more? And then secondly, uh, protein replacement therapies. Are those anything that could be a consideration? I know there are inherent issues with uh, possible protein replacement therapies, but it, with the SAPI or the SAPI protein, is that something that yeah, um, and thank you for that question. I know that there was more than one time I got that question in the last couple of days, so it's a good good point to bring up. So as far as gene editing, um, it's a little tricky. Um, you saw how many different ways there is to get the syndrome, so there wouldn't be one way fix it all. That's the starting point. So, you know, and we see this in different genetic conditions that you, you may, might be able to find a treatment for one specific type of misspelling or mutation more than the whole thing. So that's, that's the starting point. The second thing is that you're trying to fix, and this is the same for a gene therapy or a protein, sort of, if it was possible to, to give SAPI2 deficient person SAPI2, you know, is the same problem. You're trying to fix an issue that has been going on from the very beginning. So, you know, um, brain connections um, have been established since all your kids were in utero, in the baby's mom, I mean, the belly of the mom. So, you know, if we start treatment much later in life, how reversible will that be? You know, if with gene editing or with a, a protein, some kind of protein replacement, kind of really fix the connections that have been established for 10 or 15 years, you know. You guys, right? So her, her son has uh, SAS, but also has a second condition that, <laughs> that he inherited from you. Yeah. So as far as what are the chances that you have more than one genetic condition going on, um, I don't think that is being looked at, to be honest. The majority of the kids uh, that had the SABB2 change found, they had whole exome sequencing, which in theory, you're looking at all 20,000 genes. So if there was a second disorder to be found that also causes problems, then I would think I would know about it, just looking at the report. So my guess is that it's completely separate for you guys, you, you were unlucky enough or he was unlucky enough correct to get two separate things at the same time please um, so I'm just curious from a from a research perspective you know when we had our diagnosis done it was uh, our sample was sent off to Baylor and they did the, they, they, they did full exome sequencing at Baylor uh, to 
get our diagnosis. But presumably they're doing full exome sequencing on lots of kids um, for, for lots of various reasons at multiple places. Is there a, a, a genetic repository that you might be able to look at? Because what I'm wondering is there might be instances where, um, where for example, it, people are having mutations in the gene, but they're not having a phenotype, right? Um, or they might have the same mutation as some of our kids, but not have a phenotype. And I'm just wondering if there's, if you were able to predict based across the population, and it might give you more information about what disease progression is like and what's causing it. I don't know, it just got me thinking, um, not to single Mary and her family out, but it sounded as though their, their younger child is potentially not having the phenotype, but has the mutation. Mm -hmm. um, which I hope is absolutely the case. Right. Um, and that, so that might suggest that there's a, a silent mutation in the population and, and there's something more to it. And if you mm -hmm. have access to that data, that might be something that you could process through more, you know, without a whole mm -hmm. lot of extra legwork. Um, I don't know, I'm just no, thinking No, no, I mean, it's a good point. So I, I would anticipate if, if it's a real change in this gene and it's predicted to damage that gene, you always will have some kind of symptoms or signs externally that you have this. There's, right. There won't be a silent carrier, if I may say that, for this. I don't think there, there will be, if it's a real change. We, if, whenever you look at whole exome data, a lot of times, you know, we report variants of unknown significance. Mm -hmm. And you will see that across all the reports, not only for SAP-B2, but for any other gene. So I would think that if it's not a variant of unknown significance, but a true variant that causes damage to the gene, that person is going to have it for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, there is no repository, but like for example, uh, Gene DX, which he was here yesterday, I can ask them, you know, hey, and I actually, I did this before. Um, how many times have you seen misspellings in this gene out of all your samples? And we got that data. So I know the number that we have of how common is it is based on that data. So the repository, just like Baylor does, mm -hmm. it, it has to come from the large genetic testing companies. But I, I don't, to my knowledge, there shouldn't be any instance of a silent carrier, if that right. makes sense. Um, and all the ones that they report will be reported because they think it's a real thing. Right. I don't know. Was it accurate in what you had, or was it a was there a very big variable of how many were shown to have misspellings versus? No. So, and we used their number on you know one of the papers we had, and it corresponded very well with the data that the UK has. So. Um, on their data, we, the number that we were able to predict is about two out of a thousand kids with undiagnosed intellectual disability will have this, okay? And it's exactly, the, the UK group got 0 0.3, we got 0 0.25. So ballpark, we we're we're have the same numbers. So they had, when we qu quoted their numbers, they had, this is two years ago or something, we, they had, let's say, 15 cases out of 3,000 and something, something, and that's where we got the 0.25%. Um, now, every time uh, they find, that every time GeneDx finds a new case, they get a letter saying to contact me. N not always happens, but they're supposed to, like, the GeneDx knows that I'm interested in knowing who else is diagnosed with this. So down the road, we can query them again and say, hey, how many more you have and what's the denominator? So what is your total sample? How many positives you have? Uh, but again, it's pretty well correlated with what the UK group ha had. So, for mosaicism, is really tricky. Okay. So, I don't know what level, um, 
in your in your body you will need to express it so he was in the report it clearly said low level but it didn't quantify it so i would think that at some point if you have more than let's say 10 percent of your cell the cells in your body with a sap b2 mutation you're gonna have something i don't know if it's a cleft or delays or you know something like that um, and just remember that he had mosaicism in his blood. I'm not testing anywhere else. So I don't know, brain cells, it might be zero, right? But blood was 5%, you know? So it's a little tricky, but mosaicism, I would say there's, there's got to be a point where you, it doesn't matter anymore if you have 15% or 80%, you're going to have something. No, I mean, for him, it was, as far as I know, I mean, for, for him, it was, um, he was found incidentally to have a low-level mosaicism in his blood. So, but I don't, I don't, and I think the mom and the dad were not together anymore. So I couldn't ask, you know, what all the problems there were. But as far as I know, it was a healthy adult. So, you know. Um, he had more than one. No, 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 no. That person just had the one child, and when he had the whole exome trio, so that the mom, dad, and the child tested, the dad tested low level mosaicism. But it was just one time. Excuse me? That person, I do not know. That person had the one I know that is one of the patients in the registry, but I don't know if that dad has had more children since. Has another sex child with uh, another woman. Okay. So I was wondering if that was the same as in because I do not know. Um, well, then there must be the siblings is different because the UK is brothers. I know. Yeah. Um, and you you all know them. Uh, they're not. I would have known, and I do not know about him. So the UK, the family in the UK, is two, two, two brothers. So that would be different than the ones you're reporting. So that would be another. So yeah. Yes, sir. So I, the, I don't know if I interpret this correctly, but I had the sense from the genetic counselor that the the answer about the two percent chance was based on just what we know about. Four, four cases right out right. of 200 mm -hmm. and that we don't really know genetically because of the mosaicism you were talking about right. is that correct mm -hmm. so my question is and we're the we're the first generation of parents that we know with this so i'm assuming in some sense we wouldn't know the the about siblings of sas patients having kids with sas until we see some until we see that evolve but do we know from the family history that you've collected mm -hmm. of folks in generations before us that had similar symptoms, mm -hmm. can, you, can you make any yeah, so, and deductions that's from that? A, that's a good point. And to clarify, mosaicism does, is not inherited. So if, if, um, if there is a recurrence in siblings, right? So we, we say, okay, that mom or dad, one of them must have germline mosaicism, okay? Which is what uh, Julie was talking about. So, but for them, the offspring is a yes or no. So siblings of kids with SAS are free, to my, to my knowledge, because you do not inherit mosaicism. Does that make sense? So if the dad is mosaic and has two kids, one with SAS and one without SAS, you know, you, the, the, the second, the kid that is unaffected is not going to inherit the mosaicism. The mosaicism, the way it works, the sperm or the egg has the mutation. So you either pass the good one or the bad one, the offspring is going to have it, you know, or not have it. But you don't pass mosaicism. You yeah, don't even inherit the mosaicism. Siblings of SAS patients You're good. will have kids with Correct. No, no, more, no higher risk than the general population. 
just just about. I mean, if it's uh, it depends on how you do the math. So looking at the data, if we say 0 0.2, 0 0.3 percent, so that's two or three out of thousand individuals with intellectual disability. So how common is intellectual disability in the general population? I mean, I don't know the number, but in general, if you look at IQ scores, you, by definition, it will be two to three percent of the general population will have intellectual disability. So you're talking about 0 0.2 percent of the two to three percent in the general population. It will come down to probably close to one in 30,000 or something like that. some discussion about trying to get an insurance code associated with the syndrome mm -hmm. to kind of make it easier to get treatments and therapies mm -hmm. and paid for by insurance. Uh, are, you, is, are you aware of whether there's been any progress made on that front? So um, the, we submitted the application. We got an ic 10 code for it. It's within a larger sort of, it's, it's, we got it, I guess is what the bottom line is. It's just within a large non-specific sort of category is under chromosomal anomaly otherwise not a specified blah 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 but there is a code now that they recognize and they put it in there right yeah. um, and so it's not effective until October 1st 2018 I'm pretty sure um, or it might even be the 2019 so we'll double check that it's not actually in use yet um, we will send that information out once we have the exact date and we, we have the code and you can tell your providers um, to use that code. Uh, we are gonna continue to request the code. The, what really is gonna help us with that is getting more publications and information out there. So as we get more publications, we can go ahead and continue to submit these requests. Right, and so, right, what we should use in the meantime, and I think I have in there what the new code will be. I just have to double check when it will be essentially in place. I'm 